All right, everything is booting up, ladies and gentlemen. If you can hear the lovely sound of my voice, we will be live very soon with the bad astronomer himself, Dr. Phil Pleat. It's going to be great. But as usual, we have to wait a few minutes, let everybody get connected, all their signals get connected. See, someone just popped on YouTube. Throw a chat out there for me. Tell me what's up. Those are some big ass ants. It's them. That's how it is. A couple of people filtering in on the Facebooks. Looks like we got some coming in on Twitch now. We're going to talk a lot about this, you guys. But keep in mind, the stuff you see on your screen, state of the art special effects in 1954. It did not get any scarier than this. I think people actually had heart attacks and died. That's how scary this stuff was. Big ass ants. Hello, Vance. How are you? That is what we're talking about. Uh, big ass, uh, big ass spider is a great movie. <laughs> it's not a great movie, but it's uh, it's it's super fun. I'll tell you that. Excellent. We've got people coming in on Facebook now. People coming to YouTube. We'll give it a few more seconds. Let everybody kick in, and then we're gonna dive right into this. As a matter of fact, let's get to work, ladies and gentlemen. Hello, and welcome to Monster of the Week. We do this every Friday. This time, the channel you're watching right now. And if you're listening to this after the fact, you can watch us live at twitch.tv slash scottsegler, youtube.com slash scottsegler, or facebook.com slash scottsegler, and soon to be LinkedIn. Apparently, I just got connected for LinkedIn video. It may be on right now. I don't know. We're going to be talking about them. And our guest today is Dr. Phil Plate. He is known as the Bad Astronomer. I'll read off his bio here. He worked on part of the Hubble Space Telescope team, images and spectra of astronomical objects, as well as engaging in public outreach advocacy for NASA missions and is a great science communicator. He has written two books. Let's see if I've got a cover for one here. We have, he's written Bad Astronomy and Death from the Skies. There is the cover right there. He's also appeared in several science documentaries, including How the Universe Works on the Discovery Channel. And he's had a couple shows of his own. He's worked for the JREF. He is just an all-around good guy for science communication. That's the plug for his book. The plug for my book this week is going to be Bones Are White, a short story collection I have that is available in ebook and an audiobook over at Audible, iTunes, everywhere else. The reason for that is because that collection has a story called You Social Networking, which involves big ass ants that eat people. Not as big as the ants we're going to talk about, but let me get Phil off the mute here. And then we're going to boom, dive right into it. Ladies and gentlemen, without further ado, I welcome Dr. Phil Plate to the show. Hello, Phil. Hey, nerds. <laughs> okay hang on a sec there we go i'm trying to figure out a way to look in the chat room and twitch has given me twitch has given it's, me issues it's tricky because you're going to be you're going to be behind the chat room no matter how you do it um yeah, there's a bit, well, of, a bit of a delay the side there and i don't know where you are there you are hello yes, yes. Look at all oh, these lovely, technology. lovely people. So let's talk about, first of all, let's introduce people. If you've not seen the movie Them, you are missing out on a treat. It is from 1954. It is a black and white science fiction monster film from Warner Brothers. It was produced by David Wiesbart, directed by Gordon Douglas. It starred James Whitmore, Edmund Gwen, Joan Weldon, and James Arness. And we are going to talk a bunch about this movie. One of the fascinating things about this movie and Dr. Phil Plain might know this, science fiction was a new thing when this movie came out. It wasn't like there were all these different science fiction things you could watch. This was among the pioneers of the genre. Phil, why did you pick the giant ants as your favorite monster for Monster of the Week? In fact, uh, to the best, best of my knowledge, this is the first giant insect movie that was ever made, uh, given, a, or at least uh, the first one that, you know, made it sort of nationwide release or however they worked that in the 50s. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and for, you know, you can think of a lot of black and white the giant movies, Tarantula, oh, yeah. uh, uh, oh, The Beginning of the End with Peter Graves and giant grasshoppers invade <laughs> Chicago. Um, but this was the first. And in my opinion, it's the best. The reason I picked this is because um, the more obvious ones were already taken, as, as we talked about <laughs> earlier, for, from your other guests. Um, but in fact, um, this is one of my favorite movies. Uh, it was certainly one of my favorite movies when I was a kid. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was always on, you know, Creature Feature or whatever, you know, a local syndicated TV show, kids show they would have, you know, Saturday afternoon Creature Feature monster movies. And this was, this was a good one. Um, there are other movies with monsters that 
I would like to have talked about maybe more, but the odds of anybody having seen those movies are so small because they're not big movies. And this was a this was a pretty popular movie. And and the thing is, and you just you rewatched it right recently? Yes, I did. Yeah, I watched it last night again. I dug up my old copy. This is a good flick. Yes, um, it is. You know, it's 1954. It's it's post World War Two. It's sort of just at the beginning of the cold war there's they make a cold war joke in it mm-hmm. somebody says what is the cold war heating up um so it's that that era it's got it's got its issues you know and you got to get past that but um the the filmography the dialogue yes um the way a lot of this stuff is lit and done it, it builds up tension really well and honestly the plot is not yeah. what you expect. It's not, it doesn't just build and build and build to the great battle scene at the end. Uh-huh. There's some twists and turns. And in the end, it's like, it just kind of ends. There's not a huge big thing. There's a very tense thing. Mm-hmm. And there's kind of a, bit, a little bit of a battle, but then at the very end is sort of the denouement. Just, they just kind of finish it. A very they- matter of fact. And it's just like, even, even the general says, light them up. Just like that, without not like light them up, boys. It's just light them up, and the flamethrowers go, and it's the end of the movie. It's pretty cool. This film is based on an original story treatment by George Worthing Yates, which was then adapted into a screenplay by Ted Sherdeman and an adaptation by Russell Hughes. And I was surprised very much when I rewatched it, being older than the last time and being more discerning of movies, how tight the script is and how how everything is foreshadowed. They this something that's missing from a lot of science horror movies now is they've got Bupka science in it, but they they set up all the Bupka science at every step of the way. So every time something new pops up, you're not surprised. It's extremely well done and well structured. You know, one of my favorite things about this movie um, is that they're dead ends. They're like, you know, they, they're like they find the giant ants Oh, spoilers, right? They find the giant <laughs> ant nest. They 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 kill it. And the way they set about destroying the nest is it's pretty good. Yeah. You know, it's like yeah. we're not they don't just barrel in there. They don't just bomb it. They have to do things in a certain number of certain steps in a certain order. And then they they realize, oh, uh, yeah, we have a problem. There are a couple of queens that have escaped and now we have to go find these other nests. Mm-hmm. So right when you think that, yes, they're about to do it. And it's like, no, this movie's just getting started. Right. They, and, you know, one queen flies off and they just kind of dismiss that which was weird it's like why have two queens and then just have one start a new nest and then just get dismiss that thing Mm -hmm. and then have another one but the point here is that you know they interview people who are they're trying to figure out where this other nest is it could be anywhere they're they're looking out for stuff they're they're looking for ufo reports missing persons reports anything weird uh and matter of fact uh, let me see if I can, sh- I can share my screen. Oh, I can't. You've disabled it. I did. Um, shoot. Can you enable that? You think <laughs> I'll take a look. Hold on more, uh, chat, stop video, make host. Uh, eh, can't, I don't know. I do not know how to do that, but. Oh man. Oh. Okay. Um, yeah, there's, um, walk us there's through a, what you're looking at then. Well, there's a, there's this great scene where, um, they realize, you know, we have to we have to listen in on the news and everything and try uh-huh. to figure out if there are any weird news stories. And there's a scene where there's a guy standing in front of a big board and it says, um, monitor all news for kidnappings, missing persons, unsolved murders, migrations of wild animals, just all the stuff. <laughs> and it turns out the, the guy who is then pulls off, you know, the, 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 the printout and hands it to somebody. Did you recognize who that guy was? Yep, yep, yep. Okay, I've seen this movie dozens of times now most of that was when i was a kid mm-hmm. last time i saw it was several years ago but still it's leonard nimoy yep leonard, leonard nimoy, nimoy. and i'm watching this last night going that's leonard nimoy how did i miss that <laughs> and so i got a screenshot when you see him it's like yeah it's him it's it's obvi- obviously him so a couple things now some people watching this are old enough to understand the the fear over nuclear weapon testing and the advent of nuclear power in America and around the world, but some are not. Uh, the basic premise of this movie, a nest of gigantic irradiated ants is discovered in the New Mexico desert. They quickly become a national threat when it is discovered that two young queens and their consorts have escaped to establish new nests. The national search that follows finally culminates in a battle with them in the concrete spillways in the storm drain system of Los Angeles. So, Phil, um, what is your take on that? this is part of the 
part of the Cold War fear. There was a rash of movies where, you know, fearing the other was a big part of it. And this was the first giant insect movie, so it scared the crap out of people. But there was also that uh, that deep distrust of science and the fear of nuclear radiation and nuclear testing, which after world the end of World War II is not unreasonable for people to be afraid of, afraid of that. As as a scientist yourself, do, does that still resonate with you? The the fear oh, absolutely. in this movie, yeah, yeah. I mean, I uh, I was born in the '60s. Uh, and uh, in the 70s and 80s, when I was, uh, you know, a, a teenager and, and all of that, mm-hmm. uh, yeah, I mean, I had nightmares, especially, you know, when Reagan was president. Um, yep. Many reasons to have nightmares then. But in this case, uh, you know, the escalation of the Cold War, um, yeah, uh, that was a big deal. And in the 40s and 50s, uh, after, um, after World War II, when it was, you know, still painfully obvious that uh, you know the, the whole world could break out in war. The United States wasn't necessarily safe, mm-hmm. and we have all these pro- the prolifer- proliferation of nuclear weapons, and nobody really understood. I don't think the public understood the effects of radiation or what it meant, right? Um, he, as well as we do now, and even you know, when I give talks about about subatomic particles and stuff, people most people don't really get what this stuff is. So you know, it's still it's still an issue. Um, so this idea of the fear of the other, certainly, although um, the idea of the Soviet Union and those issues, that hardly comes up in this movie. Yeah. It's really just about, you know, we have entered a new atomic age and we have opened a doorway into the future. and We don't know what will pass. It was, there's, there's actually a speech like that at the end. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I think that was a big deal. Somebody mentioned recently, and I've got a note to read it and I haven't read it yet and I apologize. There was, you know, there's been a dozen essays about this movie talking about fear of atomic radiation and all that kind of stuff. And there's there's a guy who wrote an essay basically saying, I think this was just about a fear about, you know, giant ants. And he makes this case that that all these other ideas, while they may be right, there may be more to it. It may be a little more straightforward that the metaphor of this isn't buried under layers uh, as much as we'd like to think. I can't argue for this, but I thought it was an interesting idea and I, I just haven't read it yet. So I don't well, know what's going on. You know, the constant need for critics and analysts to apply layers of meaning to something that may or may not have layers of meaning. As a creator myself, I've I've had that. People like, I think what you're trying to say with this book is this thing. And I'm like, no, that's yeah, not even yeah. not even well, remotely in the ballpark. But yeah, I mean, but fear of nuclear power was a significant thing. And to have it manifest it's this, itself this way in this, you know, we give it radiation and now the ants just got a whole lot bigger. <laughs> now they're just big. Yeah. <laughs> You know, Godzilla is kind of the same way. Mm-hmm. I mean, that was that was you know, especially coming out of Japan, that the fear of nuclear weapons. Oh, sure. In this case, in this case, they really they really went out of their way to apply some actual science of this. There's even a scene in the middle of this movie where the uh, the the head scientist shows a film to you know the military and everything about how ants work, how they how they sense their environment, mm-hmm. how, how their colonies work, how they attack each other with a savagery that makes man seem tame by comparison. <laughs> There's all these great, all these great lines like that. Um, and so it, 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 they talk and they, they, they use a lot of Latin names. Why this looks like, you know, blah, blah, formidica, blah, 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 this, yeah. this ant species and all that. Uh, and so there was a lot of that in there. And then there was other parts where it was just like, well, they got big because of radiation. And now, and, and there was something else um, I, I actually, for God's sake, I took notes <laughs> watching this movie last night and there were other things. And I was just like, I don't, I don't know if, you know, it's just like, maybe, maybe now they act this way because of the, because of the, oh yeah. Um, the eggs hatch these giant, you see these giant eggs in the movie and there some of them are hatched mm-hmm. and, and the scientist daughter talk about a trope. You've got the older wacky, right. Sort of mad scientist yeah. kind of guy. Uh, and his and his beautiful young matter of fact daughter, who's, who's also a scientist, also a PhD as well. So that was kind of yes, cool. She, and she's a doctor as well. Um, and she notes that it's like these ants seem to seem to hatch out of their eggs fully formed. There were no pupae or larvae. And there were and, pupae and, he, and larvae and, all over the place. <laughs> Did and you and that? the father just says, ah, maybe this is because of the radiation. That makes sense. And I'm like, no, no, <laughs> you can't just say that makes sense. Yeah, um, that part just like me. making them big. There's there are issues with making ants big. Sure. I don't think it's like, oh, we swapped out this guanine for thymine in the in the in the DNA, and now suddenly the ants are huge. <laughs> well, you know they they 
that's the MacGuffin. The MacGuffin is not to get too much into the science of the structure right. of the animal. Because what was also surprising me, even watching this again, is we sort of have this tendency to think, oh, science was very advanced in 1954, but we've learned so much. And they knew just about everything there was to know about ants back then. Our myrmecologist goes through all the science. You're like, so they really did a lot of detailed research in the script to get real science in there with the ants. And it, it pretty much paid off. It, did you, other than the size, what did you notice as a scientist? Where you're like, it's, I'm going to have to, I'm going to have to let this go to enjoy this movie. Um, well, there were some other things like uh, the noise they made. I'm not sure ants communicate by sound uh, quite as much as they indicate in the movie. Ants, uh, for example, if they find something, they'll they'll leave a scent trail mm -hmm. so that other ants can follow. And there, there wasn't any discussion of that in the movie. Um, the, in, just making something big. And, you know, we can talk about the physics of, of bigness, bignitude, mm -hmm. um, which is an issue. Uh, and it's going to come up a lot in monsters and stuff. But there are other issues like, um, yeah, if you take something like an eyeball, which is, you know, like our eyeball, you know, it's a couple of centimeters across, whatever. Mm -hmm. uh, and the pupil lets in light and it gets focused by the lens and it's interpreted by these cells in the back of the in the back of the, the eyeball that then send that to the brain. Um, you can't just make that bigger. Um, you make that bigger and you're still talking about wavelengths of light that are very small. They're going to they're going to pass through that lens and behave differently. Mm -hmm. um, you, you have a big eye. If you have an eye that's this big, um, you're going to have, you know, it, you're going to have fantastic resolution. Yeah. You're letting in light. It, it, maybe I'd have to think about this, but yeah. probably optical light is not visible light. The kind that we see, you know, Roy G. Biv red, red through violet. You're not going to be sensitive to that anymore. You might wind up seeing infrared better or ultraviolet better. Mm -hmm. So you can't just scale an eye up. It doesn't yes. work that way. Uh, uh, Biffy Queen. These ants up... didn't have eyes like ants do anyway. They they kind of made it look that way, but if yes. they made them look a little more human. I think that made them more menacing. That they, that really helped with the characterization of the ants. They did change the eyes around. Uh, Biffy yeah. Queen in the chat room brings up a good point that ant ants breathe by oxygen diffusion through the spiracles yes. in their in their abdomen yeah their abdomen and uh that yeah. oxygen will not permeate that far into it which is why i hope some someday somebody picks um mimic because mimic actually covers that when they talk about peter these have lungs like they establish as an insect that has developed lungs so ah. therefore can get to a larger size which in that movie was the moment where I stood up in the theater and went, yes! And I was the only one who seemed to know anything about insects in the entire theater. So I was like, what? Everybody I've never gotten that far things. into that movie. It's, uh, it, it's, there's a lot of good stuff in it. I will say there's a lot of yeah. good stuff in yeah. that movie. But uh, um, in this, in this case too, the, uh, the, the lead scientist, by the way, who was the same actor who played Chris Kringle in Miracle on 34th Street, the original from the 30s or 40s or whatever. Yeah. Um, he actually says something about that because they're going to poison the nest in New Mexico and they dump a bunch of cyanide grenades in there. And he says they, you know, they 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 breathe through holes along their abdomen, ah. and, and and the 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 cyanide should get up high enough to kill them, which was pretty cool. You mentioned the sound. This is one of the little trivia points I found. The sound that the giant ants make as they approach their prey is a recorded chorus of bird-voiced tree frogs, Hyla abavoca, of the southeastern U.S. Occasionally, a gray tree frog, Hyla. Chrysocellus can be heard on the soundtrack as well as these species can often be heard together in the same wetland. These distinctive whistling type sounds were reused in other films in the years that followed, particularly in Mohawk in 1956 and the Black Scorpion in 1957. I've not seen either of those movies. I don't know those. I was in Denver airport one day and the, um, the escalator needed some lubrication. Mm -hmm. And so there was, there were metal pieces scraping and it sounded just like these ants and it's funny because that's a if you watch the movie it's a very distinctive sound and it's used in the movie to indicate that the ants are far away or close mm -hmm. by and when one like appears around a corner it gets very loud uh and uh that sound is so distinctive that i mean the moment i hear it in this movie i'm like oh yeah i'm 10 years old again <laughs> thing on on our old black and white tv in our basement so yeah, it's pretty cool. And sound design is one of the things that hold, holds up pretty well in this movie. In fact, I mean, there are some very minor issues, but if it wasn't for the stodgy ants, by the way, they only built three of them. That's why you only see three ants at most in every scene because they were expensive to, to build. Other than the old school giant ant, 
The whole movie just stands up extremely well. It really endures test time, sound design included. Yeah, the lighting is beautiful uh, in a lot of the cases. Mm -hmm. um, it's, it's, you know, it, it, with a modern sense, and you, and you say, you know, what's a really creepy movie that built up tension? And you think Alien, mm -hmm. which is still, you know, 40 years old now. But other movies that are more recent, you can think of them. Um, so when you look at this movie, it, it's, it seems dated. On the other hand, if you, if, and I, I try to get this with my, my wife and my daughter too, it's like put aside, you know, the sort of modern take on movies and think about what it was like to watch this movie, maybe in a theater in the fifties or, or yes. on TV. And it's like, yeah, this, the, the way the tension builds in the beginning, it's a big mystery. I mean, this movie opens just in the desert with this plane flying around. And then you see this little girl walking mm -hmm. across the desert uh, clearly in shock uh, and the way they, they build up on what's going on. And of course, you know, you know it's going to be giant ants because we're watching this around the poster. But, yeah. But yeah, but the fact is the way they, even if you know it, the way they build up to it and they show you all this weird stuff, it, it just, it works. It's just, it's well-designed and it stands up. And I really, really enjoyed watching it last night. This, <laughs> there's like this one sexist moment where they're going to go into the nest and the female scientist is like, I'm going to go down. And of course the, the FBI guy's like, no, this is no place for a woman. He says that and she's like, listen, dude, you know, you need a scientist down there. My dad's too old. I'm going down. Yep. And he's, Rrr! and she's like, <laughs> no, this is what's going to happen. And I was like, that was cool. It's, it was really sort of a, it, it, if, if that had been made today, I would have said, yeah, we've got this idiot guy and this woman standing up for herself, which is true. But in the case of the audiences back then, they may have all thought, well, you can't have a woman being sent down there. And so her standing up for herself in that sense was an even cooler thing. I really enjoyed it that. It was part. way, way ahead of its time. I'm, I'm not, I don't know a lot about 1950s cinema, but that did seem to stand out that, uh, you know, the, the female lead was not just there for window dressing, but was, was knowledgeable and smart and relatively not intimidated, except by the giant ants, because who wouldn't be? Well, and that was and when, a, they first, when they first make their appearance. And boy, was that that was shot well. She's standing at the bottom of like a little bluff, uh -huh. and then the ant comes over. It's the it's the shot that you used for the promo here for this this thing. Yep. And uh, I mean, then she screams and falls backwards. But it's like, yeah, hello, you know, fifteen foot ant <laughs> is coming over the hill. So that could have been anything. But but at that there point, you, you know, she's still getting in there and mixing, even even being terrified. And in in fact, they they go down into the into the nest. And one of the cops, uh, uh, she she points out this like this the structure, and she says, "Oh, look at this! It's held together by saliva." And the cop says, "Look, spit's about the only thing holding me together right now, too." <laughs> so it's like the guy is actually saying, "Yeah, I'm scared," and she wasn't. So it was like, "There's just cool stuff and in there." I really liked it. Going di first movie with giant insects, and you can see the influence on this movie all the way through to Alien, Aliens. So many other movies have used some kind of subterranean creature and that 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 close confines, the inability to get away, the easy the way you can be easily trapped. They did all of that extremely well. And, you know, they 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 did have weapons. Another um, little trivia trivia fact is everybody you see using a flamethrower in that movie. Those are actual U.S. Army working flamethrowers. And they, because they were all World War II combat veterans who had used flamethrowers in the war. That's kind of like, that's another thing that it's a wake up call to when this movie was made and how, how different things are. Yeah. You said they only made three ants and that's shocking to me because yep. um, I was always really stunned at this because I mean, those are full sized articulated models and they, I mean, yeah, they look a little goofy, but not as goofy as, you know, a hundred other monster movies that you've seen. Right. Uh, and they, they, you see them burning a lot and you see them shot a lot and it's like, okay, <laughs> you know, you can shoot that from a couple of different angles. And so it looks like a fresh ant coming in. And, but I mean, it seems like they burned a lot of those ants more than three, because you see the three in the first nest that they burn and then they're burning some later. So I'm wondering how they were able to, reuse that shot maybe they just had different cameras at different angles uh, but it sure seemed like they, they built maybe you know, they 30 or to, 40 of these things maybe they're able to build different skins on it and just cover it and burn it or, or maybe i don't know fancy, but, i mean there you go fire. here we are 75 years later trying to figure how they made this movie uh <laughs> and, you know so that's, that's pretty impressive it's and pretty in fact impressive. um and it, I, I was re-watching um ant-man and the wasp i think it was yep and you know 
this is not a popular opinion, but Ant-Man and Ant-Man and the Wasp are two of my very favorite of the MCU movies for okay. a lot of reasons. Okay. I like a good heist movie. I like Paul Rudd. The music in Ant-Man and the Wasp is head and shoulders above the rest of the MCU. But anyway, um, I think it ends with them watching them at a drive through It might start with it. I can't remember, but they're at a drive through They've shrunk themselves down and they're like showing it on TV. But they're little, so they have a bunch of other cars parked, a lot of Hot Wheels or something parked yeah. around them. And it's a very cute scene, but they're watching them, which I always thought was great. And I and it made me wonder, I mean, most people, they would wonder, it's like, is that a real movie or what? And it's like, yeah, it's a matter of fact, it is the Ant movie. There's so, also a, like uh, a, a shot for shot remake scene in Ant-Man where they're facing one of the one of the actual ants that are actually small, tiny ants, but he's so much smaller. And I forget where it is in the movie, but they they did homage to this in a couple of different places. And now oh, I'll have to look that up. OK, because I may have missed that, which is surprising to me. So, it's real okay. subtle. It's real. Subtle. But I miss Leonard Nimoy. <laughs> there you go. And Mel Cooley is in it, too, from the Dick Van Dyke show. If you ever remember that show. From I love the that show. That was a great show. Yeah. Mel Cooley. He always played a reporter. He's in that movie for like one minute. I wanted to go back to talking about how science fiction was new, which is as a science fiction writer in my living is writing science fiction. It's almost impossible to conceive of a time where an idea like this was so original and had never been done before because Godzilla came out in 54 just like this movie did. And these, these giant leaps in entertainment where people are conceiving of this new stuff that hasn't been there before. But the monthly film bulletin stated that uh, despite the science fiction film genre being new, it had developed several subdivisions including the otherworldly, the primeval monstrous, the neo-monstrous, the planetary visitant, etc., but that them is a well-built example of the Neo monsters, less absurdly sensational than most. Some of the chat rooms talking about the movies where they're flying brains running around eating people. At least they had yeah. a myrmecologist for them, so he knew what he was talking about. Yeah, uh, when I think about a lot of these other giant movies like Tarantula, that one was just bred to be really big, as I recall. There was some experimental lab where they were growing big things. Oh, this movie scared the crap then, out of me when I was a kid, dude. Just scared me so bad. Yeah, and and they, in in a sense, I, and I imagine it must have come, it must have come out after them. Um, they it ends kind of the same way. It all takes place in the desert, and they just wind up napalming it. They have airplanes fly over, dropping napalm on it. Um, uh, but beginning of the end, um, they they led them away by, as I recall, using like megaphones playing the cricket mating sound or something. And we're able to draw them away. I don't remember how they killed them in that movie. It's been too long since I've seen it, mm -hmm. but Peter Graves was in a handful of these movies, like, like Zontar, the thing from Venus or whatever, and a few others. Um, but most of those movies are silly. Uh, you know, it, it, even, even back then, when you watch them as a kid, you're like, this is a little bit silly because the special effects weren't that good or whatever. But with them, with the, the, the tight plotting, the fact that they were, it seemed realistic and that the way it builds is realistic. There are dead ends where they're interviewing people who have seen weird things and it turns out, no, that was nothing, forget that. But then, you know, there's this, this guy who said he saw some flying saucers that were shaped like ants <laughs> and, and, and they talked to him and that was well done. Uh, and oh man. That's some of the death, that scene. The, the deaf script writing there. Like, how do we explain this? How do we show this? And to go into the nuts and bolts of screenwriting, just just have a guy say he saw a thing, and that's all they needed to do to move the plot forward. And in in fact, they were you know the heroes are trying to keep this thing secret so there's not a panic. This guy he's being held in a mental institution basically because they think he's yeah. lost his mind because he's seen flying ants. And he's like, can you help me get out of here? And they're like, we'll see what we can do. And then immediately turn around and tell the doctor, yeah, the guy's nuts. Leave him in there. And I was like dude cold <laughs> and it was just but it's just like that's what the hero has to do and there was no sense of well that sucks that i yeah. have to do that so there's in those in those movies there's not a lot of introspection there's not a lot of you know is this the right thing to do uh so you're just moving the plot forward but but with the fast dialogue the snappy things that are going on you, again because of the style of the time you have to kind of overlook that but even so, I, I you know it's just the, the the pacing on it is so great. And you would it. think you would think that uh, writing into a screenplay, hey, there are giant predatory monsters around and in, in Los Angeles. Let's not warn everybody that that would be that's sheer buffoonery. And yet, over the years, we have seen many instances, not with giant ants, but of things that are very as far hazardous. As, you know. as far as we know, they're <laughs> very hazardous to people. And the powers that be have decided to keep that keep that quiet because we don't want to create a panic or anything along those lines. Uh, Tarantula yeah. was 1955. 
So it's okay. possible that they were like, oh, this movie made money. We're going to go out and fire one up, too. They were also able to use a real tarantula and just shoot it because it's much bigger than that. They could shoot it, put it in slow motion, and that part looked looked pretty good. So, Yeah, they were, what is that, rotoscoping in or whatever that was called at the time. Um, there are times you just can't be practical special effects. Uh, yeah. And, you know, especially back then. And so just, you know, making a big giant ant. It's going to work. It's going to work. And Especially it when work. it grabs one of the guys and squeezes him and he's screaming and it's yep. like, crap, <laughs> crap. That's really cool. It worked extremely well. Uh, Chris McWhite in the chat room mentions if they redid them properly, maybe flying queen ant would be the focal point. I have one of my dreams is to write a remake of them. And I really? think, yeah, I've always wanted to re- write a remake of this in the modern times, really serious horror. And to me, the scary part is larvae. If you can get, Larva moving around because they're so big, there could be changes. Those things eat voraciously where the adult ants are much more a servant to the colony, a servant to the queen. So I think that some of those underground scenes with some nasty, squishy things that have big mouth parts trying to eat you would be super fun. For one of the questions we had in the chat room as we finish this up was, uh, what were the names of some of those movies, the more less known movies with monsters that you you like? So people can go check those out. Oh, gosh. Uh, well, besides the ones I've already said, um Oh, Monolith Monsters was a was a terrible but fun movie. You know, a good one is um, Curse of the Demon, which I think in England was called Night of the Demon. Uh, I just rewatched that recently. It's on YouTube, I think. Okay. And beautifully shot. Uh, well done. Very scary, actually, if you kind of ignore, again, the time it was made. But basically, uh, if there was a giant a monster movie, giant insect movie, aliens invading, any of those movies I watched when I was a kid, I ate them up. One yeah. of my favorite movies of all time in England was called Quatermass in the Pit. Uh, in America, it was Five Million Years to Earth. Um, this is an unbelievable movie that has everything aliens, cavemen, uh, spaceships, telekinesis, ghosts, the devil. Yes, the <laughs> devil. Uh, it's all in there and it's, uh, and it, and it's um, very dystopian and the ending is super grim. Loved it when I was a kid. I still do. Phil, let me go through for the, we got a packed house for you today. It's very fun. Let me go over what we've wow. got coming up in the weeks to come. Upcoming guests. Next week, Friday, scientist Rachel Burks, and she's going to talk about the cookie monster. She feels the cookie <laughs> monster is, people don't know what a savage the cookie monster really is. After that, we're going to have actress Rachel True of The Craft and Half Baked. She's going to be talking about John Carpenter's The Thing. The following week, author Amanda Debert. She's going to do Medusa from the old school Clash of the Titans, not the new stuff, kids, the, the old school. And then on September 17th, we're going to have actor Lucky Yates, who's going to cover Audrey 2 from The Little Shop of Horrors. That is going to be, that's a fantastic lineup of people. Phil, thank you so much for coming on the show. And your current work online is where? Where do people go read more about you? Oh, God, it's everywhere. Um, I write for sci-fi.com. That's the Bad Astronomy uh, blog. Just look up Bad Astronomy. You'll find it. And, you know, the usual places, Twitter, Instagram. I've got a newsletter, badastronomy.substack.com. And that's 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 pretty much it. But that that covers the covers the planet pretty well, I think. Gotcha. Phil, thank you for bringing your scientific knowledge about giant ass ants onto the show. That is much appreciated as I try and figure out how to shut down Zoom. I don't even know how to shut down Zoom. So <laughs> this is Well, not... thank you, Scott. Glad, glad to have you, sir. And I will go back to Maine and talk to you soon, buddy. I appreciate it. Bye, everybody. Bye. We quit out of Zoom, everybody. And meeting for all. I got a little smoother in that. That was super fun. That was Dr. Phil Plate, the bad astronomer himself. It was really nice to see some people in the chat room who were unfamiliar with Phil's work so we could expose them uh, to what Phil does. Phil would be kind of one of his early moments of coming to fame and becoming such a great science communicator is his discussion about the movie Armageddon and the, uh, the astronomy and science in that. And it's quite hysterical. You should go look that up sometime. Thank you all for being on. Once again, come back next week. We're going to have Rachel Burks telling us why the Cookie Monster is probably a cannibalistic serial killer. After that, one of my favorite monsters, John Carpenter's The Thing. That's going to be great. Author Amanda Debert, comic book author, book author, talking about Medusa from Clash of the Titans. And then on September 17th, the amazing Krieger, Lucky Yates. He is going to be talking about Audrey 2 from The Little Shop of Horrors. And that is it for me for this week. Thank you all for tuning in. Watch out for big ass ants. And when you hear those tree frogs chirping, that might be it for you.